body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my brother and producer, Joel, here with me as well. What's up, man? What up? We are back with another serial killer. But today we are talking about a very interesting person, and that is Eileen Wernos. And she's actually the first woman ever to fit the FBI's profile of a serial killer. So many people basically consider her to be America's first female serial killer. Oh, cool. I feel like so often we're talking about males and male serial killers. And yeah. So I was like, and plus this was a highly requested episode. Actually, a lot of people are very interested in Eileen Wernos. I mean, she's got an absolutely insane life story uh, to go along with her crimes. So you're in for a, a wild ride today. But before we jump into all that, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who has not only checked out my CBD brand, Higher Love Wellness, which by the way, if you need CBD or interested in CBD or hemp extract products, higherlovewellness.com, I've got you covered. Also, if you haven't left a review or rating for our show on Apple Podcasts yet, please go take a minute and do that. We'd really appreciate it. It does really help us in the charts, and we have actually been doing really well starting to climb those charts. I think we're in the top 50 on Spotify right, right now, which is oh, awesome. Wow. I think we were like 38, I want to say, when I checked the other wow. day. So that's awesome. Then I checked Apple Podcasts the other day, and I think we're in the top 90. Yeah, we're like top like 100. Top on, 100, yeah. Which is crazy. It blows is my mind, really honestly. Good. Right. I mean, with how many true crime mm -hmm. podcasts and shows like ours that are out there these days, it's, it's pretty amazing. So thank you to everybody who has subscribed on Apple podcasts and followed us on Spotify yeah. and left us ratings and reviews. It does really help us out. For Plus, sure. You and I have read like almost every review <laughs> we on do. the Apple we, podcast app and there's a ton of positive ones. And then, uh, you know, there's always going to be some negative ones, but it doesn't matter to us. We just like the feedback to see, you know, how we can improve the show for you guys. That's yeah. All that's that what matters. we're trying to do is yeah. trying to make the best experience possible. And, Absolutely. You know, like, the whole show is premised around very dark topics, but at the same time, I've, I've kind of realized like maybe it's okay to kind of step out of the darkness for a little <laughs> bit and, and do some yeah. more, not necessarily like lighthearted stuff, but just more, le a little less death and torture every right. once in a while. Just, I think. A, just a little more family friendly type stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't know if, I don't know if we'll ever be family friendly on here. I mean, I guess, right. I guess we, we kind of, yeah, kind of yeah, in a way. no, but, th th that was a little too much on my end, but yeah, we're, we're not like rated G or nothing. So. No, <laughs> definitely not rated G. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've got the explicit warning for a reason, but yeah. you know what I mean? Just like, cause I want to get back into some more aliens, some more UFO stuff. I oh, want to get yeah. back into some more, you know, kind of explore different aspects of the paranormal a little bit more because lately we've just been very focused on, on absolutely brutal killers yeah. and Lots of death and destruction, Lots of death. which right. I mean, is, is I guess interesting to, to talk about, but yeah, at the same time, it's like, I feel like we need to change it up too. So yeah, for sure. So if you guys have any suggestions for topics for us, we do have an email that you can reach us at and that's LOP at milehire.com and feel free to email any suggestions or links to documentaries or we really need some more hauntings. Uh, yeah, we do. We've kind of gone through the the laundry list of some of the most popular ones out there. Mm -hmm. But then again, like when you're giving us suggestions, think about whether or not there's enough for me to do a 45 minute to an hour right. show on it. Because true, a, some of the stuff you guys have sent just aren't long enough. Like no. there's just not enough for me to really dive into it in a full yeah, episode. Right. And maybe we can do some more bonus stuff later on, which we're actually in the process of of building out our uh, basically fan club, I guess yeah. you'd call it, but it's really YouTube memberships. Um, if you're familiar with that, if you're a YouTube watcher where we'll be posting additional content, things like that. Absolutely. Um, for a subscription, which will, which will be really cool. And also allows people to earn badges and get more interactive with our content, which I'm super, we're both super excited yeah. about the yeah. badges. And, and not only that, I mean, we've know. just got so much going on yeah. lately. We're, we're in the process of, of moving to a new studio. Actually, we're, uh, going to be moving into kind of our own space. So, and, oh, yeah. you know, I have other shows as well that I'm in. So we're kind of in the process of transitioning to that. And once we kind of get settled with that'll be, we'll, we'll be able to do a lot more, which is cool. Cause Joel and I want to jump on a live stream, hopefully here yeah, in the next month sure. or two. And We've just, been wanting to do that, but yeah, I just haven't had time. Nope. It's just been one so, thing to the next. So yeah. just a, just a few updates from our side of things. And 
yeah hopefully i mean god we're coming up on we just did our 50th episode right. last week. So and now I was we're... just reading the comments from our last video and, you know, people are saying we've already been at it for a year. So happy one year anniversary. We're coming up on it. I mean, 52 episodes in a year if mm -hmm. we do one a week. So yeah, well, this is 51. Mm -hmm. So we got one more. We'll be at 52. So a year's worth of episodes, oh, yeah, which is just mind blowing. Honestly. That is. It feels like we just started this like I the other know. day and we're coming up on our, we've already passed our, technically our year anniversary yeah. think, coming up. So crazy man time's flying when you're having fun man uh, that that's true <laughs> very true so thank you all for the support yeah, thanks guys and yeah let's uh let's go ahead and get in today's episode it's also brought to you by hellofresh blenders eyewear stamps.com and bartleby learn so eileen wernos was born eileen carol Pittman on february 29th 1956 in rochester michigan and growing up she often went by the nickname lee her parents, Diane Pratt and Leo Dale Pittman, got married in 1954 when they were 14 and 16 years old, super young to get married. And about a year later, they had their first child, which was their son named Keith. Two months before Eileen was born, Diane filed for divorce and she ended up with custody of both children. Eileen's father was in jail when she was born and as far as anyone knows, she never met him. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and in and out of jail and mental hospitals for the entirety of her life. He actually went to prison for kidnapping and sodomizing an eight-year-old boy, and then he ended up hanging himself in his cell in 1969. And there's some accounts out there that say he was actually strangled by another inmate, but it's never been confirmed. So just, I mean, born into a very chaotic environment, obviously not that stable of parents clearly so when Eileen was just six months old her mother was overwhelmed with how hard it was to have two crying unhappy babies who are always making a racket so she would drop them off with their finished born parents Lowry and Britta Wernos and then just never came back they ended up legally adopting their grandchildren in March 1960 and raised them as their own and as far as Eileen and Keith knew Lowry and Britta were their parents and their aunt and uncle Lori and Barry were their step siblings. And it was actually rumored that Lori had raped his daughter Diane and Eileen really was his biological daughter. Which if that's true, that's just that just makes everything more more just fucked up honestly. But most of what's known about their childhood in Michigan came from Eileen many years later. According to her, life with Lori and Britta was rough. They were both alcoholics and there was a lot of physical and emotional abuse. Britta was a strict disciplinarian and often whipped her granddaughter with a belt just for kicks, is how Eileen would explain later on. Lori was physically and sexually abusive. He would force Eileen to strip off her clothes before molesting and beating her. Despite what Eileen claims, her step-siblings would later claim that they had a normal childhood that was strict but not abusive at all. But more than one of Eileen's friends witnessed Lowry beating her. Eileen and Keith were forced to follow strict rules or not supervised at all. When Eileen was six years old, her and Keith were setting fires with lighter fluid and she ended up being severely burned and scarred on her face. And by the time she was 11, she started trading sexual acts for money, drugs, cigarettes, and even food from the boys at her school. Many young boys in the neighborhood actually had their first sexual experience with Eileen, including her own brother, Keith. Around this time, Eileen and Keith discovered that Britta and Lowry were really their grandparents, and Lori and Barry were their aunt and uncle. And after this, they were harder to control and started spending more time away from home. In junior high, Eileen's teachers were very concerned about her. She was acting out more and had hearing loss and vision problems, and they discovered that her IQ was 81, which is considered low average or in the low dull normal range. And they advocated for her to see a counselor and gave her a mild tranquilizer to improve her behavior. This was also about the same time that Lowry started letting his friends rape Eileen. When she was 13 or 14 years old, one of these men got her pregnant. Neighbors claimed it was an older friend of Lowry's. Others believed it was a man named Chief who was known as the local pedophile. But Chief eventually died by suicide. She waited six months before telling Lowry and Britta that she was pregnant. And according to Eileen, no one believed that she was raped. Her family blamed her and just called her a whore. She was then sent to a home for unwed mothers, 
and the staff said she was hostile and didn't get along with the other girls there. But on March 23, 1971, Eileen gave birth to a boy, but Lowry forced her to give up the baby for adoption. So after Eileen had the baby, she went back home and was shunned by the kids in her neighborhood and at school. They called her names and said terrible things about her. And this is when she fell deeper into drugs, which were very easy to come by during this time, especially drugs like LSD. Her brother Keith and Aunt Lori liked to throw huge parties at their house every chance they could, and Eileen used the money she made doing sex work to buy alcohol and cigarettes for the parties. And other than taking her money, Lori pretty much ignored Eileen. During one party, a few guys threw Eileen out the back door into the snow and wouldn't let her back in. Just absolutely abused at every which way. I mean, every turn she made, every person it seems like she encountered abused her in some way. By the 10th grade, Eileen dropped out of high school, and she was at this point a heavy drinker and drug user. A few months after moving back in with her grandparents, Britta died of liver failure from years of alcohol abuse. Instead of taking care of Eileen and Keith on his own, Lowry told them if they didn't move out, he'd kill them. Eileen's biological mother, Diane, always suspected that Lowry actually killed Britta and used her death as an excuse to kick the kids out. Now 15 years old, Eileen became a warden of the court, but she didn't live in foster homes. Instead, she spent the next two years living in the woods at the end of her street. She slept in abandoned cars or just on the ground, even during the coldest months of the year. And the only way she could really support herself was with petty crime and sex work. And she went by the alias Sandra Kresh. And in order to bathe or shower, she would head over to the nearby gas station or in a motel room of one of her Johns. It was a very dangerous life. I mean, at just 18 years old, she is already basically homeless and doing sex work and just trying to survive. And at this point, she had been raped more than five times. Just probably one of the hardest you know, childhoods you could possibly have. I mean, especially for a woman, I mean, or a man, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is just brutal no matter what. And very difficult to come out of it unscathed, right? I mean, with just so many horrible and traumatic experiences, especially the rapes, it's very, I mean, it's not hard to see why she goes the way that she does. But Eileen did have some friends. Her best friend, Don Botkins, tried to help her as much as she could. And she later said the kids were so cruel to Eileen, now regret it, and try to lie about giving her clothes and food. But after two years of living outside, Eileen decided that she'd had enough and started hitchhiking around the country. She worked as a waitress, a maid, a pool hustler, and a sex worker. And her life on the road led her to rely more and more on sex work as a way to make steady money. And luckily, there's actually a good amount of clips, uh, interview clips of Eileen, so I'm going to include some in this episode. So here's an interesting clip of Eileen describing how she got into sex work and what that was like. I wasn't uh, too high priced so I could keep the customers satisfied. Soon after leaving Michigan, she started to really build up her rap sheet. She was arrested for things like drunk driving, illegal possession of a firearm, forgery, assault, armed robbery, car theft, resisting arrest, obstruction of justice, disorderly conduct, and disturbing the peace. Officers consistently described her as an erratic, angry woman with a poor attitude. In 1974, she was actually in our home state of Colorado, where she was arrested for disorderly conduct, drunk driving, and firing a gun from a moving vehicle. But she actually skipped town before the trial started. In 1976, she was arrested in Michigan for disturbing the peace and assault after throwing a cue ball at a bartender's head. Four days after this incident, her brother Keith died of throat cancer and left her $10,000 from his life insurance policy. But $10,000 for Eileen did not last her very long at all. She actually blew through this money in just two months. And she actually ended up buying a new car for herself that she eventually totaled. Around this time, her grandfather committed suicide. And now she really had nowhere to go back to. So her new goal was to move to Florida. You know, who wouldn't want to move to Florida where it's always warm and sunny. You know, if you don't have a place to, to live, I mean, definitely want to be somewhere warm. So she hitchhiked to the state and right away she met 69 year old Lewis Fell and he was the president of a yacht club and made a comfortable income from railroad stocks. Eileen was desperate for security and in May 1976 they actually got married. 
and news of their marriage was included in the society pages of the local newspaper. But two weeks later, Lewis got a restraining order against her, claiming she attacked him with his own cane when he wouldn't give her more money. Eileen said he was the one who attacked her with the cane. And nine weeks after getting married, the marriage was annulled. Throughout her life, Eileen attempted suicide at least six times. The last known time was in 1978. When a boyfriend broke up with her, she was so distraught she shot herself in the stomach. But she ended up being okay and being treated at the nearby hospital. Which happened to be in Daytona Beach. And Eileen really liked the Daytona Beach area. She hung out at the Last Resort Bar, which was a biker bar in Port Orange, and stayed at the Fairview Motel. She had casual friends she could drink with and made enough money to get by by doing sex work. Again, she was arrested multiple times in Florida under her legal name and under multiple aliases. And in 1981, she ended up serving some jail time. At the time, she was living with a boyfriend, and after a bad fight, she drank 24 beers and took four Librium, which is a sedative, and decided to test her boyfriend's love. She planned to get arrested to see if he would bail her out. And if he did, that meant he loved her. So she went and robbed a convenience store clerk at gunpoint and stole $33. She ended up getting arrested less than two hours later and sentenced to three years in prison. And guess what? Her boyfriend never came for her or visited. Wow, what a surprise. Right. But just, you can just tell like how desperate she is and with peace and love how dumb she was yeah. you know seriously like i mean she i think she at this point she just didn't care yeah i mean clearly she didn't care what happened to her and is just about survival at this point and just right. trying to grasp on to anything but a psychiatrist examined eileen and reported that she had an average intelligence surprise and short-term and long-term memory issues he noted that she didn't suffer from any thought disorders or delusions though eileen also told the psychiatrist that she had been raped 10 to 12 times since leaving home she also used a lot of drugs including marijuana uppers downers lsd mescaline cocaine and pcp and she had experienced complete blackouts since she was 19 years old she was in prison for about two years and released in june 1983 but less than a year later, she was convicted again for forging some checks. By 1985, she started using her aunt's name, Lori Grody, and was suspected of stealing a revolver and ammunition under this alias. A month later, she was arrested for Grand Theft Auto, resisting arrest and obstruction. The police found a 38 revolver and ammunition in the car she had stolen. That June, she was arrested as Lori Grody, and she had pulled a 22 caliber pistol on a man in his car and demanded that he pay $200 that she said he owed her. The police found ammunition on her and the gun under the man's passenger seat. And a week later, she was pulled over for speeding under another alias, Susan Blahovic. And the ticket included a note from the officer that said, Attitude poor. Thinks she is above the law. Most of her regular Johns, though, are middle-aged or older low to middle class white men, and she had only ever dated men. By her late 20s, she decided to switch things up in her personal life and actually started dating women. Her first relationship with a woman was serious enough that Eileen bought her a pressure cleaning business. It was doing pretty well, but her girlfriend ended up robbing her and leaving her with a $400 phone bill. And obviously this caused the business to close soon after. In June of 1986, Eileen met the woman who had become the love of her life, Tyria Moore, who she affectionately called Ty. Eileen, now 30 years old, met Ty, who was 24, at a gay bar in Daytona Beach, and they immediately hit it off and were soon living together. And their relationship was very intense, and they were rarely ever apart. But Ty later said she wasn't comfortable with Eileen making money as a sex worker, But that's all Eileen wanted to do. So she convinced Ty to quit her job as a maid and let her take care of them. Ty looked tough, but she was actually a pretty codependent person. She spent her days drinking beer, relaxing by motel pools, and watching TV while Eileen went out to make money. They rented motel rooms by the week, crashed with friends, or slept in old barns, or camped out in the woods even. They hung out at the last resort bar a ton 
and sometimes slept on the old car seat in the bar. Even though they never stayed in one place for too long, Eileen felt like she had found real stability with Ty. She viewed them as Bonnie and Clyde type characters, and her favorite thing to do was drink beer and shoot guns in the woods with Ty. Eileen dreamed of living off the grid, just the two of them, and bought books on being a survivalist. She started referring to Ty as her wife and actually gave her a diamond ring to wear as a wedding band. But the honeymoon didn't last. Eileen was jealous and possessive, and she could fly off the handle for the smallest reasons. Sometimes she started fights with complete strangers or acquaintances for no reason, and when her outbursts turned violent, she terrified Ty, who just didn't know how to handle Eileen's rages. But if the police were ever involved, she'd come forward as a witness and say Eileen was acting in self-defense. But Eileen just kept getting in trouble with the law, and on the 4th of July in 1987, they were taken into custody under the aliases Tina Moore and Susan Blahovic after hitting a man in the head with a beer bottle. That December, Susan Blahovic was cited for a suspended driver's license and walking on the interstate. And for the next two months, she actually sent threatening letters to the circuit court clerk signed by Susan. In March of 1988, she had a new alias, Cammie Marsh Green, who accused a bus driver of assault. And she claimed he had pushed her off the bus and Ty came forward as a witness. And that November, Susan Blahovic was at it again making threatening phone calls to the supermarket every day for six days after getting into a fight about lottery tickets. And at this time, Eileen continued hitchhiking along highways in central and northern Florida to find clients. She had started talking to Ty about her anger toward men and how she wanted revenge for all the times she'd been hurt. And at this point, she was now traveling with a loaded pistol in order to protect herself. The couple was also having some financial problems and owed about $1,200 to the motel that they were staying at. Eileen could make about $200 to $300 on a good day, but Ty was going out a lot and spending the money as fast as Eileen could make it. Things took a real dark turn on November 30th, 1989, when Eileen came home that night in a stolen Cadillac. She got drunk with Ty, and while watching TV, she confessed that she had shot and killed a man. Earlier that night, a man had picked her up in his Cadillac, They bought beer and he offered her vodka and marijuana. They then drove into the woods and fell asleep. She woke up first though, got out her 22 pistol and woke the man up. And at that point she robbed him at gunpoint and then fired three shots. She then dumped his body in a wooded area along I-75, which is a busy tourist route in Volusia County. Eileen took Ty out to the parking lot in order to show her the 1977 Cadillac Coupe de Ville and other things she had stolen from this man. Ty didn't want to know anything else. She was afraid if she knew too many details, she'd feel like she'd have to turn Eileen in. Eileen swore it was a fluke, and oh yeah, I'm never gonna kill anybody again. But over the next year, she continued to come home in stolen cars with random items to use or pawn. On December 1st, 1989, a deputy found the first lead in what would become a multi-county murder investigation. He discovered an abandoned 1977 Cadillac near Daytona Beach in Volusia County. This car belonged to Richard Mallory, a 51-year-old owner of an electronics repair shop in Clearwater, Florida. He was a shady guy. He had been divorced five times and spent five years in an institution for sex offenders. And he often closed the shop and took off for days to drink, party at topless bars, and pick up women. He was also paranoid, often firing all his employees at once and changing his locks eight times in three years. In early December 1989, he didn't show up to open the shop like normal, and the employees just went home, assuming he'd come back, or that maybe they were just all fired. But because of that, he was never reported missing. The day after the car was discovered, Richard's wallet, several condoms, and a half-empty bottle of vodka were found nearby. On December 13th, two young men were out looking for scrap metal along I-95 and found a dead body wrapped in a carpet. It was actually several miles from where the Cadillac had been abandoned. So these young men called the police and investigators took fingerprints from the badly decomposed body, but they were able to identify it as Richard Mallory. And they were able to determine that he had been shot three times with a 22 caliber gun. The few leads the cops had didn't pan out and the case quickly went cold. And they didn't realize at the time that this was just the beginning of the murder spree. 
On May 5, 1990, another body was discovered just over the Florida state line in Brooks County, Georgia. The unidentified male was shot twice with a 22 gun. Authorities in Georgia had no idea such a similar murder had recently happened in Florida. On June 1, 1990, a land surveyor came upon the naked body of David Spears in the woods of Citrus County, Florida. He had been shot six times with the same 22 caliber firearm. A condom was also found nearby his body. David was a 43-year-old heavy equipment operator who was last seen leaving work in Sarasota, Florida on May 19th, and he was driving to visit his ex-wife in Orlando, but never made it there. His truck was found abandoned on May 25th on I-75 with the doors locked and license plate missing. On June 6th, 30 miles away in Pasco County off I-75, another naked male body was found. But this body was so decomposed they couldn't get fingerprints or even estimate a time of death. This body was eventually identified as 40-year-old Charles Karskaden, a part-time rodeo worker, and he had been shot nine times in the chest and stomach with a 22 caliber gun. He had actually been missing since May 31st and was last seen somewhere along I-75 driving to Tampa to see his fiance. The day after finding his body, his car was found in Marion County, along with a 45 automatic weapon and a few other things that had been stolen. A detective in Pasco County noticed similarities between this murder and the David Spears case from Citrus County, so he decided to contact detectives there. But they decided that there wasn't enough evidence to officially link the cases and definitely not enough to sound the alarm about a potential serial killer. But what they did notice is that there is definitely a pattern. All the victims were middle-aged white men who were passing through the area and traveling alone. Before we continue, I'm going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Fresh from San Diego, California comes the only sunglasses brand that I'll probably ever wear again. And the brand I'm talking about is Blenders Eyewear. And you're going to be just as hooked when you see how awesome these shades are. I got a couple of pairs from Blenders Eyewear. And I absolutely love them because I've got a pair for driving. I got a pair for taking walks. And I got just a spare for anything else I need. Not only are the glasses half price, but they also still offer polarized lenses, which is really cool. And I've got to say I'm super impressed with the quality. The, the plastic isn't super cheap and breakable. I mean, these things are high quality for the price and they look great. And plus they don't just have just sunglasses. Blenders has readers and blue lights, as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories. So live life in forward motion with Blenders today. Score 15% off your Blenders purchase. Just visit BlendersEyewear.com and make sure you enter promo code LIGHTSOUTVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com. Use code LIGHTSOUTVIP for 15% off. Blenders is rocked with pride worldwide. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love to eat. I love to cook good food as well. And what's made my cooking better and made my just diet better has been eating meals from HelloFresh. HelloFresh sends you a box in the mail with all the pre-portioned ingredients and fresh produce and meats that you need to make some of the most delicious recipes I've ever had in all sorts of different cuisines. And what's great about it is that the, they give you a card that's got all the steps on it. It's usually like six or eight steps and the meals only take about 30 minutes to make. So with your busy schedule, it's super easy to fit in a HelloFresh meal and it's all there waiting for you in the fridge when you're ready to cook. If you haven't tried out HelloFresh yet, I highly recommend it. I eat HelloFresh meals all the time. Absolutely love them. And I love the convenience of their service and impressed with the quality they deliver every single time. So if you want to try out HelloFresh today, go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut12 and use code LightsOut12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. What a deal. Go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut12 and make sure you use code LightsOut12 and you get 12 free meals, including free shipping. With HelloFresh, you get America's number one meal kit. So on June 22nd, 1990, a missing person report was filed for 65-year-old Peter Seams. He was last seen on June 7th driving from Jupiter, Florida, to visit some out-of-state relatives. He was a retired merchant seaman who actually worked as a missionary. A few weeks later, on the 4th of July, Rhonda Bailey was sitting on her porch in Orange Springs near Seminole Indian Reservation, and a car drove off Highway 315 and crashed through a nearby fence, smashing the glass on the front doors and the windshield. And Rhonda watched the whole thing go down. Two women got out of the car and threw empty beer cans into the woods. They were both injured and frantic, especially the blonde woman. Her arm was bleeding 
and she was angrily swearing at a smaller brown-haired woman. When Rhonda came over to help, the blonde woman begged her not to call the police. She said her father lived just up the road, and so they got back in the car and tried to drive it away, but the car stalled almost immediately. The women got out and then just took off and fled the scene, but they were stopped by a volunteer fireman who asked if they had been in a car accident that had been reported. The blonde woman said no and actually swore at him, and she screamed that they didn't want his help. The car was a 1988 Pontiac Sunbird, and there were bloodstains all over the inside, and the license plate was missing. Police lifted a bloody palm print from the inside door handle and got detailed descriptions of the two women from multiple witnesses. A search of the car's VIN confirmed that it indeed belonged to missing Peter Seams. The detective on the case distributed sketches of the women to law enforcement across the state and sent their descriptions to agencies nationwide. Another man was reported missing on July 31st, Troy Burris, who was a 50-year-old delivery driver last seen leaving Gilcrest Sausage, which was a sausage factory in Ocala. He missed his last few stops and never returned from his normal delivery rounds. At 2 a.m., his wife reported him missing, and sheriff's deputies found his abandoned delivery truck off of Highway 19 a few hours later. The truck was unlocked and the keys were gone. The search for Troy ended on August 4th, though. A family was out on a picnic and they found his body in a wooded area in Marion County about eight miles from where his truck had been found. What's interesting is that his credit cards, some business receipts, a clipboard, and an empty cash bag were found nearby. But because his body was severely decomposed from the Florida heat, he was only identified by his wife from his wedding ring. The medical examiner was also able to determine that his cause of death was two gunshots to the back and chest with a 22 caliber gun. In September, investigators from three counties got together to compare similarities in the cases of David Spears found in Citrus County, Charles Karskaden found in Pasco County, and Troy Burris found in Marion County. All three men were found shot to death with a 22 gun and left in a wooded area. They were also all known to be traveling alone, and it was at this moment that the detectives now realized that the reality was, was that they were facing or dealing with a serial killer. On September 11th, 1990, just five days after the detectives from the three counties met, 56-year-old Dick Humphreys was reported missing by his wife. Dick was a retired Air Force major and former Alabama police chief. He was currently working for the Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services as a protective investigator, specializing in abused and injured children. And September 11th was his last day before transferring to the department's Ocala office. But he never made it home. His fully clothed body was found on September 12th in an undeveloped subdivision in Marion County. And what was odd is that his pockets were turned inside out. He was also shot seven times in the head and torso, Six 22 caliber slugs were found in his body, and the seventh went through his wrist and was never found. Dick and his wife had celebrated their 35th wedding anniversary on September 10th, and his car was found about a week later behind a closed down gas station in Live Oak, Florida, which is roughly about 100 miles from Marion County. And again, the vehicle's license plate was missing, and it wasn't actually traced back to him until October 13th. But that same day, his badge and other belongings were discovered in Lake County, about 70 miles from where his body was found. With his background in law enforcement and a distinguished career, Dick's case was a high priority. Detectives formed a task force operating out of Ocala, the largest city in Marion County, in order to investigate these recent deaths. It was coordinated by Marion County Sheriff's Investigator Sergeant Bruce Munster. And Bruce believed that because the victims were shot mainly in the body and not the head, they were looking for a woman serial killer. They claimed that a man was just more likely to aim for the head because that only needed one shot. Captain Steve Binniger, commander of Marion County Sheriff's Criminal Investigation Division and part of the task force, agreed that, you know what, we are looking for a woman suspect. But he took it a step further and actually linked the cases to the two women who crashed Peter Seam's car on the 4th of July. And before they could make much headway on their theory, another body was found. On November 19th, the body of 62-year-old Walter Antonio was discovered in the woods near a remote logging road in Dixie County. 
Walter was a truck driver from Merritt Island who also worked as a security guard and reserve police officer for Brevard County. He was also found fully nude, except for a pair of socks, and he had been shot four times with a 22 gun, three times in the back and once in the head. He had been dead less than 24 hours, and his clothes were found in a wooded area in neighboring Taylor County. Five days later, his car was discovered across the state in Brevard County. His badge, nightstick, handcuffs, flashlight, and a gold ring were all missing, though. But by now, the media had put the pieces together and reported on the connections between all these deaths. Sergeant Bruce Munster and Captain Steve Binninger agreed that it was time to go public with their theory. They wanted to warn people that it was dangerous to pick up a female hitchhiker or sex worker, or even to stop to help a woman in distress. And with several of the victims, there's no evidence of sexual activity. But then on November 30th, they released the composite sketches of the two women suspects based on descriptions of the crash from witnesses as well as a warning to beware of women asking for help on the side of the highway newspapers across the state reported on the story and the dominant blonde woman was quickly named the damsel of death over the next three weeks investigators received hundreds of tips and before long they figured out that the women were traveling as a couple as susan blahovic and tyria moore so they were able to track their movements across the state through motel receipts. They also found a criminal record for Susan Blahovic, but nothing substantial for Tyria. Just one dropped breaking and entering charge from 1983. They also discovered that Blahovic had another alias, Cami Marsh Green, but there was no criminal record under that name. Volusia County officers discovered that Cami had actually pawned a camera and a radar detector that belonged to Richard Mallory in Daytona Beach on December 6. She was required to leave a thumbprint on the receipt. When they did a computer search of the thumbprint using the automated fingerprint identification system, they found nothing. But fingerprint expert Jenny Ahern went in person to Volusia County to meticulously search fingerprint records by hand. And guess what? Her hard work paid off. Cammie's print was matched to Lori Grody, who had an outstanding warrant for a weapons charge. It also matched the bloody print found inside Peter Seam's car after the crash. The task force sent all these records to the National Crime Information Center and got hits from Florida, Michigan, and Colorado. Susan Blahovic, Cammie Marsh-Green, and Lori Grody were all the same women. And the actual woman was Eileen Carol Warnos. After the composite sketches were made public, Ty knew the police were closing in. The police were looking for two women suspected of murder, and the sketches looked just like them. It's never been really clear exactly how much Ty knew, but at this point she knew enough to leave town. And when she came back from a Thanksgiving trip with family, she packed her things, gave Eileen her wedding band, and moved back to Pennsylvania with no other explanation. This obviously devastated Eileen, and it wasn't long before she was more or less homeless, spending most of her time drinking all day in bars. She actually took the wedding band and pawned it for 20 bucks. After spending the night on the old car seat at the last resort bar, she woke up and immediately started drinking again. That afternoon, January 9th, two men she met the night before named Bucket and Drums stopped by. Bucket and Drums? That must have been the covers they had knowing that they were going to go ask for, you know, prostitution. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Bucket. Hi, I'm drums. <laughs> I don't know why it makes me think of KFC. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> like, what the fuck? It's like a KFC commercial right there. Yeah. What the hell? But all of them got together and drank and talked, and they offered her a motel room where she could shower and sleep. So she agreed and followed them out to the parking lot where she was immediately surrounded by men in suits. And that's when she was arrested on the outstanding warrant for Lori Grody and taken into police custody. So it was just a sting after all. I mean, that seems like pretty obvious. That's such weird names for like undercover cops to go by if they're doing a prostitution sting, I feel like. Definitely. It's a bit too obvious. Yeah, it's like she wasn't like suspicious. I'm like, uh, Uh, bucket and drums? What? What kind of fucking name is that? For real, though. But this plan was put into motion starting on January 5th, 1991. Officers Mike Joyner and Dick Martin went undercover as bucket and drums. Small-time drug dealers from Georgia. (laughs) Drug dealers selling meth-covered KFC. (laughs) <laughs> that'd be funny if they were oh, used KFC. Be. but after days of searching they finally spotted eileen at a bar on january 8th she was almost arrested twice that night by other officers which would have derailed the undercover mission but they were called off just in time 
Mike and Dick, as bucket and drums, started talking to Eileen and bought her a few beers. They talked for a while and she decided, you know what, it's time to leave. It was around 10 o'clock. They offered her a ride, but she declined. She then walked to the last resort bar where Bucket and Drums just happened to run into her later that night. They then bought her more drinks and hung out for a while, but then they left after midnight and she spent the night at the bar. The next day, January 9th, 1991, the undercover officers went back to the bar equipped with transmitters to keep the task force up to date in real time. The arrest was planned for that night, but the bar was hosting a huge biker barbecue and soon it would be crowded with bikers. So they made the last minute decision to just arrest Eileen on the spot and she was arrested as Lori Grody and the police didn't mention the murders or alert the media at all because they needed more time to build their case and to find Ty Moore. The next day they tracked Ty to her sister's home in Pennsylvania and she was taken into police custody and brought back to Florida the following day. She admitted to knowing about the murder of Richard Mallory but she said she only had suspicions about the others. So they made a deal with her. If she could get Eileen to confess and agree to testify against her, she wouldn't be charged with anything. They said they'd give her full immunity as a state's witness. The police then put her up in a motel and gave her a constant supply of Budweiser and hamburgers. And that's when they recorded 10 phone calls between her and Eileen over four days. On January 14th, she made the first call to Eileen in jail. Ty said the police suspected her of the murders. Eileen reassured her that the cops didn't know anything. And all this time, they were talking in code. She was soothing and loving, and while Ty sounded genuinely panicked. One of these recorded calls led investigators to a storage unit in Daytona Beach, rented by Eileen. She had the key on her when she was arrested, so they were able to open it, and inside they found clothing, jewelry, watches, toolboxes, and suitcases belonging to the victims. Several items were identified by Stephen Seams, Peter Seams' son, including the missing license plate, a shaving kit, jackets, a suitcase, and a pair of scissors. During the last call, Ty finally convinced Eileen that the police were after her, and she would go down for the murders if Eileen didn't do something. So Eileen agreed to confess in order to save Ty. So here's a clip of that phone call. I'm going to have to because I'm like going to go to jail for something that you did. This is unfair. My family is a nervous wreck up there. My mom has been calling me all the time. She doesn't know what the hell's going on. Okay. You got to do, okay? All right. I have to confess everything just to keep you from getting in trouble. I will. Okay. So don't worry, okay? Okay. I love you. No. Don't we'll do it now. Get it over with. And then on the morning of January 16th, Eileen told the police she was ready to talk. And she gave a taped confession. All in all, she admitted to killing six men, but all in self-defense. Richard Mallory, David Spears, Charles Karsgodden, Troy Burris, Dick Humphreys, and Walter Antonio. However, she denied any involvement with the John Doe from Georgia and the disappearance of Peter Seams. She said Ty wasn't involved at all and didn't know anything about what she had been doing. Once the media found out about the confession, the story just blew up, making headlines across the country. It was murder with a feminine touch. People couldn't get enough. At the time of her arrest, the FBI had no profile for a woman serial killer. Women had killed multiple people before, but she was the first who fit the profile of a male serial killer, meaning killing more than three people that she didn't know and who didn't know each other, as well as letting time pass between each murder. Under this definition, she was called America's first woman serial killer, and she was studied by criminologists. The family and friends of her victims saw her as a monster, Others viewed her as a feminist icon rebelling against male oppression and violence and openly defying authority. And this view continues to this day for many. Offers for book and movie deals also started pouring in immediately. Everyone wanted the rights to Eileen's story. She initially thought she could make money, not realizing there was a law against profiting from a crime she committed. But soon the story took a very strange turn. Arlene Prawley, was a 44-year-old born-again Christian who ran a 35-acre horse ranch with her husband Robert in Tennessee. And when she saw Eileen's picture in the newspaper, she said she saw something in her eyes and was compelled by God to contact her. In fact, I'll play a little clip of Arlene actually talking about how she found and contacted Eileen. I read about her in the newspaper. I saw her pictures in the paper, and my dad was in the hospital with a heart attack. 
And um, my husband and I had nothing to do but read papers, and so we read the papers on her. And as soon as we saw the pictures in the paper, her eyes, I mean, I read people's eyes, and I just knew she was not capable of being a serial killer and doing what they said. So we prayed for two and a half weeks, and finally, at the end of two and a half weeks, we reached out to her. Arlene actually sent Eileen a letter which ended up leading to a phone call. They had an instant connection, and Arlene said their relationship was soul-binding, and they started talking nearly every day. In fact, Arlene actually ran up a $4,000 phone bill. But in November 1991, Arlene and Robert legally adopted Eileen Wernos. Arlene started talking to the media on Eileen's behalf, including talk shows and tabloids. She wanted the world to know that Eileen, who she called Lee, was a good person with a good heart. She showed off her artwork and read her poetry. At the time, Eileen didn't know that her new adopted mother was getting paid for these interviews. But the first case to go to trial was for the murder of Richard Mallory. Eileen was charged with first degree murder, armed robbery with a deadly weapon, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Eileen was represented by public defenders Trisha Jenkins and Billy Knowles, who negotiated a plea bargain. Eileen agreed to plead guilty to six charges of murder and would receive six consecutive life sentences. This also took the death penalty off of the table. But the district attorney wanted to put her to death and rejected the plea. The judge came out of retirement too just to try the case of Eileen Wernos and make sure she got the punishment she deserved. On January 13, 1992, the trial for the murder of Richard Mallory began. The courtroom was packed with reporters and people who wanted a glimpse of the country's first female serial killer. And the biggest mystery of the case wasn't if she was guilty, but if she would get the death penalty. Prosecutors focused mainly on her taped confession and argued for the death penalty because the murder was committed during a robbery. The defense tried to get the confession's tape thrown out because Eileen had been manipulated by law enforcement. They argued that she confessed in order to save Ty, not because she was guilty. However, this request was denied, and the jury was shown clips of the confession. She had said she acted in self-defense more than 60 times, but none of these clips were shown to the jury. Under the Williams rule in the state of Florida, the prosecution introduced evidence from the other murders, even though they hadn't gone to trial yet. And this allowed them to show a pattern of cold-blooded murders establishing her as a serial killer, and made the jury highly skeptical of the self-defense argument. Prosecutors also introduced physical evidence linking her to those crime scenes. This included her bloody palm print, a cigarette found in a victim's car, and pawn shop receipts from items stolen from the victims. They also called more than 312 witnesses. And it didn't help that the medical examiner for Richard Mallory's case testified that he had taken between 10 to 20 minutes to die and that it had been an excruciating death. The prosecution's star witness was none other than Ty Moore. She talked about Eileen's confession to her, that she had killed a man, and said she didn't seem upset or remorseful about it at all. And as you can probably imagine, this was extremely difficult for Eileen to listen to, I mean to hear the person that was closest to her basically turn on her and throw her under the bus was very, very difficult. Eileen was basically in tears during it. The defense called just one witness though, Eileen herself. Her attorneys advised her against testifying, but she was insistent that she wanted to speak for herself. Over time, her story had changed multiple times depending on who she was talking to. The version she told in court was very different from her initial confession to the police. In court, she described the attack and rape by Richard Mallory in horrifying graphic detail. She said that he violently raped her, he choked her, tied her to a steering wheel, threatened to kill her, and then used rubbing alcohol from a Visine bottle to increase her pain during the sexual torture. When he untied her and told her to lie down, she was sure he was going to kill her. And she even remembers him saying, you're dead, bitch. You're dead. So Eileen spit in his eye, and while he was turned away, she grabbed her gun out of her bag. And after a brief struggle, she managed to shoot him twice. But she said he kept coming after her, so he shot him two more times. During the cross-examination, the prosecutor picked her story apart, and she got very angry and defensive multiple times. Her attorneys had to keep telling her to stop answering questions. Eileen ended up pleading the fifth 25 times in order to avoid incriminating herself. Public defender Billy Nolas later said he believed Eileen had borderline personality disorder developed after severe neglect and emotional abuse from her childhood. 
but the defense didn't call any witnesses to corroborate this, which is crazy because clearly she has mental illness issues, issues from her past that are very deeply rooted and would have been helpful to have, you know, a psychiatrist or somebody, a mental health professional to testify on her behalf for sure. Multiple witnesses had come forward and volunteered information that would have helped Eileen's case, but none of them were called by the defense. After closing arguments, the jury deliberated for just 90 minutes. And on January 27th, they found Eileen Wernos guilty in all counts, including first degree murder. Then the penalty phase began the next day. In Florida, jurors hear arguments from both sides, again before recommending a punishment, which is ultimately decided by the judge. During the post-trial proceedings, the defense tried to introduce evidence about Richard Mallory's past. In 1957, he broke into a woman's home in Maryland and violently attacked and tried to rape her. And he actually went with an insanity defense and spent 10 years in a prison mental institution. Detectives on the case denied any evidence existed that suggested Richard was capable of the violent sexual crimes Eileen described, but his criminal record wasn't buried or hidden. A simple search would have uncovered it. The media had even reported on it back in November, a month before the trial began, but the judge refused to allow this new evidence to be discussed. The defense was allowed to introduce new information about Eileen's background, her difficult childhood, and all the abuse she had suffered. And luckily, in the post-trial proceedings, three psychologists testified that she did, in fact, have borderline personality disorder, extreme mental or emotional disturbance, and even brain damage. And the fact that her story had changed multiple times was a symptom of her mental illness, not that she was lying. And her IQ of 81 was low enough to prevent the state from putting her to death. Prosecutors called Eileen's aunt and uncle, Lori Grody, and Barry Warnos to testify that they had a normal childhood that wasn't abusive, of course. Barry said that his father was tough, but he also said that Eileen was never beaten or molested, like she claimed. The only physical punishment he ever witnessed was her being spanked. The jury sided with the prosecution again, however, and voted 12-0 to zero for the death penalty. And on January 31st, 1992, she was officially sentenced to death. Many people argued that Eileen deserved a retrial. It wasn't fair that evidence of murder she wasn't convicted of yet could be used against her, but proof that the man she killed had a history of sexual violence was omitted. Her defense team failed to thoroughly research the case and didn't call any witnesses besides Eileen. She also seemed to be delusional. She really thought the case would be overturned and she would move into a cottage on her new mother's property where they would raise horses and she-wolves together. But after the trial, three law enforcement agents involved in the case, including Steve Binniger and Bruce Munster from the original task force, announced that they were making a deal with an entertainment company to tell the whole story. And after a ton of backlash from the public, the deal was called off the following week. And it turned out that they had hired lawyers within weeks of Eileen's arrest to help them negotiate these deals. Two of the officers were transferred and one resigned as a result. Ty Moore made multiple book and movie deals in order to sell her story. There was a rumor that the officer's deal with Ty was for immunity and to get them in on the movie deal. Some believe the officers even started negotiating contracts for these deals before Eileen was ever arrested, which is crazy. When Sergeant Brian Jarvis found out that other cops were involved in all this, he was taken off the case, harassed by fellow officers, and demoted back to the patrol division all within a month. He also found a threatening note on his door, and someone broke into his house to steal files related to the case. Investigators blamed the break-in on the media and then accused Brian of staging it himself. And Brian would go on to eventually resign from the police force, which is crazy. This whole, whole Eileen case completely ruined his life because people were trying to make money off of her story. There was an investigation into these officers, but nothing ever came of it. And the whole thing just went away quietly, of course. Before we get into the end of the story, though, I'm going to take one more ad break and we'll be right back. Are you in school? If you're in school, and you're having trouble getting your homework done in a timely manner, then you need to check out Bartleby Learn. Because Bartleby Learn helps you get your homework done fast and your homework done right. And it's really the easier way to study. With Bartleby, you'll get 24 seven homework help in more than 30 subjects, including business, science, math, and engineering, as well as accessing helpful learning materials, getting step-by-step -step solutions to millions of textbook problems, and their subject matter experts on tap who can help you answer even the toughest questions when you get stuck. So check out Bartleby today. You can sign up free for Bartleby at getbartleby.com slash lights out and ask 10 free homework questions. That's get B-A-R-T-L-E-B-Y.com slash lights out and you'll get 10 free homework questions. 
I mean, come on, who doesn't want free homework help? This offer is valid through December 31st, 2021. And with Bartleby, it's the easier way to study hard. And our last sponsor for today is stamps.com. No one wants to go to the post office these days. A, there's a pandemic. B, you know, there's always a long line. It doesn't matter what post office you go to. There's always a line out the door. Nobody has time to wait in line for all of that just to get your packages shipped or to get some stamps. With stamps.com, you can do everything that the post office can do right from the convenience of your home or office, which is super nice. I actually use stamps.com for my higher love wellness company and I use that for all my postage. And what's great is that not only do I not have to go to the post office anymore, but I get discounts up to 40% off my postage, which is awesome. So stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code lights out, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. And there's no long-term commitments or contracts. They have great support as well. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in lights out. That's stamps.com. Use promo code lights out. And with stamps.com, you'll never have to go to the post office again. So after this first trial was over and behind them, Arlene hired a new lawyer for Eileen, a guy named Steve Glazer. Steve was a musician, a former hippie, with a law degree who advertised himself as Dr. Legal. In fact, there's a funny Dr. Legal ad clip. We'll play a little bit of that for you. Most of us will probably never worry about spending time in jail, but if you are ever involved in the criminal justice system, you will need a lawyer who can explain the system to you. But Dr. Legal ignored the controversy over the police being involved in movie deals, which could have been used to get her a new trial, and had Eileen plead no contest or guilty to the other murder charges. Arlene wanted her to plead guilty so she could be forgiven by God. And Steve Glazer was told that Eileen had borderline personality disorder and actually ignored that too. He was either inexperienced or just completely in over his head, or he was just in it for the money, which he denies. But together with Arlene, they negotiated interview fees for Eileen and took most of the money for themselves. Meanwhile, Eileen was being sent from county to county to be sentenced for all of the murders. Eileen was very angry about being used by politicians and all the people who just wanted to make money off her story. To the public and to all the people of the world and to the news personnel that have been working on this, these trials and these cases for the past 16 months that had stated defamations and mendacious lies of 98.6% magazines and news articles to uh, probably paid off by the cops to vile my character, make me look like a monster and deranged or something like a Jeff Dahmer, which I'm not. Honestly, I don't blame Eileen. I mean, it's honestly bullshit that everybody else is profiting off of her, you know, her cases. Right. She's she's on death row and she's having to stand trial for murder. And then she has all these dumb fucks that are her legal team that are just <laughs> trying to take advantage of her, trying to make a buck. Yeah. I mean, I would be pissed, too. So oh, I, don't, yeah. I don't blame her at all for being so angry with everybody. But during her sentencing hearings, prosecutors made constant comments about her being a lesbian even though she never considered herself one. They were using society's fear and hatred for gay people to make sure she got the harshest possible sentence. They also used the fact that she was a sex worker against her. They took advantage of society's stigma against sex work and the belief that her high-risk lifestyle made whatever happened to her her own fault, which this this whole stigma goes on today, like in nearly every state in the entire country, I feel like, but especially in the South. I feel like they have a bigger, much bigger problem with that than in some of the other states. But in similar cases involving male suspects, the death penalty is often never brought up as a possibility. And high-profile male serial killers also get better representation in court. Ted Bundy had offers from multiple prestigious private criminal defense attorneys to represent him pro bono. His defense team even included a volunteer consultant on jury selection. However, Eileen was never offered any free legal help even though her supporters advocated on her behalf. Everyone from politicians to the Christian right had campaigned for her execution. And in March 1992, she pled guilty to the murders of Troy Burris, Dick Humphreys, and David Spears. And as a result of the convictions, she received three more death sentences, and she did not react well to the news. I know I was raped. You weren't nothing but a bunch of scum. Therefore, these proceedings are now Putting completed. somebody who was raped to death? 
In June 1992, she pled guilty to the murder of Charles Karskaden and received a fifth death sentence. In February 1993, she pled guilty to the murder of Walter Antonio and then got another death sentence. At some point, Eileen agreed to take investigators to the spot where she dumped Peter Seam's body in South Carolina. And when nothing was found, officers believed she had taken them on a wild goose chase just to get a vacation from jail. His body has never been found and no one has ever been charged for his murder. And for a while, Eileen didn't know that her adopted mother and lawyer were getting paid for these interviews. A documentary filmmaker named Nick Broomfield interviewed Eileen many times and actually made documentary films on her. At one point, Arleen and Steve quoted him a $25,000 fee for an interview with Eileen, and he was able to negotiate that fee down to $10,000. And after he paid the money, he had a hard time scheduling the interview and confronted Arleen about it. And by this time, Eileen had figured out that, you know, she was just being used to make money. She said they manipulated her into pleading no contest in the other cases. Arleen made her feel guilty about putting her new mother through more trials and convinced her that the movie deals would fall apart if she just pled guilty or no contest. Eileen also claimed that Arlene and Steve tried to get her to kill herself in jail, so she now knew for sure they weren't on her side. According to Eileen's former public defender, Trisha Jenkins, Steve never picked up the discovery files from the trial. He also told her that he had only taken her case for the media exposure. Dr. Legal. What a scammer, man. Right? The people who were supposed to care about Eileen always seemed to just use her for what they could get for themselves. So many people had cashed in on selling her story. She even suspected that Ty was using her for money all along. And after losing many of her regular clients, she claimed Ty convinced her to go back to getting picked up by strangers to keep making money. And Eileen believed that this decision was what led to the murders. But she still missed Ty and loved her. and She took responsibility for the murders and expressed remorse for everything she did. Still. She never viewed herself as a victim or blamed anyone else for the circumstances. Her anger was pretty much concentrated on the police officers and politicians that she believed were corrupt. At the time, Jeb Bush was Florida's governor and running for re-election on a law and order ticket. He used Eileen's case to get a bump in the polls right before the election. She did have one friend left, though. Her best friend from Michigan, Don Botkins. And she wrote to her every morning at 5. She held on to Eileen's childhood mementos, family pictures, a copy of her will, and her intricate ink drawings that she liked to show off. After multiple death sentences, Eileen kept insisting that she had killed in self-defense, claiming the two of the men had raped her and three of them had tried to. She said that she never provoked the men in any way. Eileen ended up getting a new attorney for her appeals, Joe Hobson. He believed she had been failed by the system since she was a child, and now she's being failed by the legal system and her lawyers. He wanted to get her a retrial based on her previous defense attorney's inadequate representation. Her appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, however, was denied in 1996, and after that, Eileen started fighting to be executed. She was tired of people using her for money and political gain, and in 2001, she petitioned the Florida Supreme Court to allow her to stop all pending appeals and fire her legal counsel. She was ready to admit that she had robbed and murdered all her victims in cold blood and denounce any claims about self-defense. She was just ready to go. Witnesses were called to the final hearing and all put up in a hotel together. Among them were Steve Glazer, Nick Broomfield, and Don Botkins. Eileen rejected her own witnesses and said they were all lying, but they were called anyway. Nick was asked mainly about Steve's legal representation of Eileen, including his alleged drug use at the time and receiving interview fees. Now, there's actually like a clip in this documentary uh, that Nick Broomfield made called Selling of a Serial Killer where he actually films Dr. Legal, Steve Glazer, smoking, I think it was like nine joints, seven or nine <laughs> joints on the way to the prison. Oh, damn. To be her like legal representation. Like he didn't give a fuck. Wow. He literally got high as shit I was like, to go deal with. Like he didn't care. It was yeah. clearly basically proving that this is just about money for him. Like, right. Did he not wasn't give actually, a fuck about No, he wasn't trying to be a good lawyer. Whatsoever. No. Yeah. He was just getting high in the car. And then, and then they actually... A prosecutor brought it back up in court at some point, and he was like, it, it was pretty funny because he was like, didn't you smoke like seven joints on the way to the prison? He's like, no. Sir, your eyes were red as stop signs. Like, yeah, and this guy's clearly fucking <laughs> lying. Wow. Yeah, what it, a it, clown. Yeah. That's a clown. Dr. Legal, man. Jeez. You can never trust somebody who goes by Dr. Legal. <laughs> no. God. Uh. 
And in court, they showed a bunch of these clips from his documentary he did and, and basically exposed Dr. Legal to the entire courtroom, the jury, the judge and everything to prove that, you know, everybody was really profiting off of Eileen's case and that she did not get fair representation or adequate help with her case. It was just it's honestly mind blowing that this all went down the way that it did because things might have turned out a little bit differently for Eileen if she had had a competent lawyer that wasn't high off his ass uh-huh. you know, during his legal uh, sessions with her. But a childhood acquaintance named Danny Cornwall testified that Eileen started trading blowjobs for cigarettes at nine years old. Ugh. Crazy. That's so young. I know. Just from like birth, it's, she was just already doing all the dirty shit. It's like crazy. Yeah. I mean, she, she kind of had to just to survive. She was like in survival mode, and that's how she survived. Another man named Jerry Moss said when they were kids, he only treated Eileen nicely when they were alone. If anyone else was around, he threw rocks at her and yelled at her to go home. Don described how she saw Eileen's grandfather whipping her with his belt while she leaned over a chair. He beat her for five straight minutes knowing that Don was watching. But in the end, the death sentence was upheld and all the witnesses were sent home. Eileen stuck to her new story. She said that she selected her victims, robbed them, and killed them in in order to eliminate the witnesses. And she knew they were going to die the second she got into their cars and that none of it was self-defense. She sits down with Nick in the the documentary and tells him, gives this kind of final confession that I I did this because, you know, A, these guys were assholes and they raped me and tried to, or tried to rape me and beat me. And that's partly why I killed them. But it really came down to robbery for Eileen. Like Eileen wasn't a killer who kills for thrill. It wasn't a thrill killer. She was a killer because she needed the money. She was robbing them essentially. And you, you know, kill the only witness there is and you might get off with the robbery so that's that's why she ultimately killed these men yeah desperate for money because they were she was homeless basically right. the whole time yeah i mean she was just trying to like pay get by her, yeah and, pay her bills and right. stay alive and feed herself and everybody like everybody else was just taking advantage of her and she had to do all mm-hmm. this dirty illegal work in order yeah. to just to survive out there yep and the other reason for kind of coming forward at the end is she, you know, once the death sentence is stuck, she knew that no matter what, I'm going to be executed and, you know, probably soon. So she really, really seems like she got, you know, into Christianity and kind of reconnected with her faith towards the end. And she's, she's quoted as saying, I don't want to go into the execution chamber uh, as a liar. I, I want to, you know, confess everything and put it all out there of exactly what happened before I die. And that's exactly what she did. While she was in prison, they even used radio waves and beamed them into her cell in order to control her mind. And while in prison, Eileen just mainly kept to herself, rarely left her cell. She'd read her Bible, watch TV, wrote to Don, and just really prepared for death. She also cried a lot to make sure she didn't cry in the execution chamber because she said she wanted to get it all out. In early September 2002, Governor Jeb Bush signed Eileen's death warrant. Her execution was scheduled for October 9th. On September 30th, 2002, the governor granted a stay of execution for Eileen based on concerns from one of her ex-lawyers. He ordered a mental examination to determine her competency, but insisted that as soon as she was given the all clear, she'd be put to death. Three psychiatrists interviewed Eileen for 15 to 30 minutes and determined she was competent, so the execution was back on. Eileen passed on doing a press conference and asked Nick Broomfield to conduct her last interview. She didn't want to talk about whether she was guilty or not or about her cases. She just wanted to talk about police corruption and how they had used her and set her up. She also talked about the sonic pressure torture, how they tried to make her look crazy and why she had to wash her food to avoid being poisoned. She said she wasn't ready to die and that, quote, God, Jesus Christ, and all the angels would be there with her. She had done the right thing and saved other people from being hurt by the men she killed. So she knew she was going to a better place. Nick tried to ask her again if she had killed her victims in cold blood or in self-defense, and the tone immediately changed. She said that she shot her johns if she ran into trouble or when physical trouble came along, which sounds like the other ways of saying self-defense. But Eileen got angry as she explained how people used her to get rich and get reelected. She said she didn't get a fair investigation or trial and seemed to admit self-defense again when she called herself a raped woman. 
All she cared about was giving information to investigate the corrupt police and politicians. And she didn't want to say anything about herself or her story. She ended up cutting that interview short with Nick just after 35 minutes. And Nick wondered how she was able to pass the competency evaluation. Eileen had her last meal with Don the night before her execution. And with her $20 budget, she had Kentucky fried chicken and french fries. God, that's so ironic that the cops that like arrested her bucket and drums and yeah. her, she, that's so weird. I wonder if that was on purpose because they like knew she liked KFC or something. I don't know. It's, well, it's weird been. that her last meal was KFC. Yeah. And that's we were thinking that earlier. Just <laughs> something to do with KFC. What the fuck? That's so weird. Mm-hmm. But after her last meal, Don told Nick that Eileen was sorry for how the last interview went. She was afraid that if she said any more, she wouldn't be executed. The next morning, Eileen was woken up at 5.30 a.m. She passed on a meal and just had coffee. She seemed calm and wasn't talkative at all. A priest came to her room so she could confess her sins, but she sent him away. Instead, she knelt down in her cell and prayed for her victims by herself. She worried that they might be too evil to be accepted by God. The lethal injection was administered at 9.30 a.m. in front of 32 witnesses, and she was pronounced dead at 9.47. Eileen was 46 years old. And I heard lethal injection is still a painful way to die. Yeah, I mean administered at 9 30 that's 17 minutes of death of dying uh-huh and excruciating pain right I mean, internal pain yeah going it's, on. it's yeah. running through all your veins and Ugh. everything like yeah I've, I've heard the same thing that it's absolutely a horrible horrible death mm-hmm. and that's why they stopped it in many states uh, oh yeah the true. use of lethal injection according to one news reporter though who witnessed execution eileen had turned to look at them just before the injection and she made a bizarre face smiled faintly and then turned away She closed her eyes and her head jerked backward. Her mouth dropped open and her eyes opened slightly. And then she was gone. Eileen had been allowed to make a final statement with no time limit, but she only talked for about 30 seconds. She said, quote, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus. June 6th, like the movie, big mothership and all. I'll be back. That was her final words. She was the second woman to be executed in Florida since it was reinstated in 1976. She was preceded only by Judy Buenano, who died in the electric chair in March 1998. Eileen was reportedly relieved that Florida no longer used the electric chair. Shortly before her death, Nick Broomfield interviewed Diane Warnos, her biological mother. She believed Eileen had suffered a brain injury during her birth. She had a frank breech birth meaning the baby comes through the birth canal bottom first with the legs up by the head. It's a dangerous position can lead to a lack of oxygen or asphyxiation. Diane claimed she had no idea that Eileen had such a hard life after she abandoned her and told Nick to ask her daughter for forgiveness. When Nick told Eileen, apparently she was super angry at the very mention of her mother's name. She said she didn't consider her family at that point and refused to forgive her. Don Botkins was in charge of Eileen's funeral arrangements and she wanted to be cremated with her Bible and brought to Don's house in Michigan to be around the people who love her. She had a special request for her wake. She had spent hours listening to the album Tiger Lily by Natalie Merchant while on death row, and she wanted the song Carnival to be played at her service. Ty Moore, after all this, has stayed out of the public spotlight and is likely just living in Pennsylvania and living a normal life after all this went down. But that is... Basically, the the end of the story of Eileen Wernos, America's first female serial killer. Absolutely crazy life. Yeah, I mean, yeah. talk about a rough, rough go yeah. in this life. Like, my God. And I think it is possible that Eileen suffered from a brain injury. Totally. You know, just because she was doing so many things at such a young age that kind of shows she was far gone quickly. Yeah. I mean, clearly she lost herself quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, she never really had any support from the beginning. Mm -mm. I mean, her parents were horrible to her. Everybody was horrible to her. Yeah. And I mean, imagine growing up in that environment where it's abusive. You have nobody you can trust and you're just sort of thrown out into the world to just survive, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, and I, I mean, there's no question that a woman's going to have a much tougher time out there than a man would have. Yeah. And, you know, especially dealing with creepy men trying to, you know, 
do things to you and things like that. I mean, right. I, I get why she did what she did. I totally understand she did what she thought she had to do in order to survive. And honestly, a lot of it's really not her fault. I mean, obviously she's responsible for killing, killing the people that she did, but you know, a lot of the things that happened to her and, you know, caused her to go in that direction really weren't her fault. She just had to adapt to this life that she was, you know, put into. Yeah. And I mean, what else do you do in that situation? I mean, well, you know, she relied on crime to make a living. And, right. I mean, know, you guess you could say it's survival at that point, you know, until you're in that position, you, you, I guess, can really never know what it's like to do what you got to do to survive. So that I think that's all Eileen was doing. But, you know, wrong, some really bad things uh, yeah. came with bad that. decisions bad for decisions. sure. Yeah. She made some very bad decisions and got the wrong people. Mm hmm you know, around her and that didn't help at all. But ultimately I think when it came, I think absolutely when it comes to her trial and her punishment, I think she just got, I mean, the hammer is brought down on her. The fact that, I mean, there's so many serial killers that are way worse right. that are serving life sentences yeah. in prison and they're still alive. Mm -hmm. And yet she was given death sentence after death sentence after death sentence because a, she was a woman and B, you know, they portrayed her as like this, lesbian you know yeah. woman and and here's here's my thought too is that i think if she had been you know maybe a more attractive woman or you sure. know she was a you know kind of like imagine her being like this bombshell girl who sure. committed these crimes would she have gotten a lesser sentence you know that was straight and just fighting off you know yeah. i was fighting off men that were trying to have sex with me or whatever I think even in that scenario, she, you know, she would have gotten different treatment. But mm -hmm. the fact that she looked, you know, not only was she a woman, but she also maybe looked like a stereotypical lesbian to many yeah. of these people. And and homeless as there. well. Yeah. Like, yeah, kinda, right. Kind of like a, a scrub yeah. or something like that, you know. And a sex worker and yeah. all these other things. Involved you know, in all this crime. Just kind of just like, oh, she's scum of the earth. Like, right. Let's just get her, get her out of here. Yeah. And so they just Definitely. went so hard on her. And it seems like the gender equality, even in the 90s and early 2000s, is nothing like it is today. Oh, no. So I, I think, like you were saying, too, part of it, her being a lesbian and, you know, just a lot it of played those, into it, a lot sure. of that played into that. Yeah. They wanted to like, she was the example, you know, uh -huh. they're like, we're going to make an example. Out right. Of her. But it was totally unfair. And she got screwed over in her, in her legal counsel. She got completely taken. Uh -huh. She did get taken advantage of. Yeah. and. Her case was sold and interview footage was sold. Documentaries were made, you know, that profited off of her and she was left with nothing. She got used and abused. Right. And killed for it, basically. Yeah. And I totally understand, you know, the punishments for the crimes. You know, you got to do the time for the crime. Yeah. But like in her case, she didn't. I, I don't think she necessarily deserved the death sentence. I think maybe I think life in prison would have been more than enough for her. And honestly, the fair and just punishment in this case. Uh huh. Well, when you compare her to people like Gary Ridgway and Ted right. Bundy and these other horrific serial yeah. killers, she really can't compete with them. And yeah. the fact that her punishment was worse is yeah. just like, what the fuck? Yeah. Death so. sentence after death sentence after death sentence, just because she, she was who she was. Yeah. So, That's yeah, I mean, it's it's just one of those. Baffling. It is. It's a, it's a crazy story. Highly recommend you watch you know, some of these documentaries that are on her. And some of the footage, there's tons of footage of her on YouTube and stuff uh, other than what we include in this this episode. But very, very interesting person and, and just life story for sure. And obviously, you know, thoughts to the victims' families and all that. I mean, obviously, they didn't deserve to be killed for what they did. But, yeah, I, I see why it all happened. So definitely want to know what you think about this one. And, yeah, is there any other evil women out there that we should cover on the show. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and suggestions on that. But that is it for us today on Lights Out. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, definitely make sure you like, subscribe. And yeah, we'll be back next week with another, another episode. <laughs> but until then, Lights Out, everybody.